Good evening. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'd like to introduce to you someone who has appeared on this stage 17 times before and who's also asked me to let you know that he has worked very, very hard on this presentation. Please give a warm welcome to Steve Goodwin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, as that part of the slide says, my name is Steve, and as that part says, I'm a bit of a geek. If we're all in the correct room, and I really hope we all are, for the next 50 minutes, I'm going to talk about FOSDEM and how it's changed and how it hasn't changed over the last 20 years. I'm going to start off with the origins, going back to 2001, go through the middle years, and then the sort of the later years when things have kind of settled down a bit. And I'm so happy it started in 2001. It makes counting how many false stems there have been so much easier. No gatepost errors. So, where do we start? Who am I? What have I done that's so impressive to me that I deserve to be on this stage? So we have a slide saying who I am, or as it should be called, the ego slide. This is where the speaker gets to brag about themselves for 20 minutes, while everyone else is forced to listen. Not in this case. These are the stuff I've done. Uh, oh, that's me with hair and a smile. Neither exist anymore. So I've been to all of these FOSDEM thingies. I've given a stack of talks. I've done you know, little things, bigger things. But the thing that's important is what's not on that slide. Nothing on there says, I am FOSDEM staff. I've never worked for them. I've never been a volunteer. All I've done is just turned up. So everything you see is based on my personal experience of turning up and going wherever there was a free dev room. So where did it start? Well, it started with this little email. Wednesday, December the 6th, at 11 o'clock in the morning. I hope you don't consider this as spam, as I think lots of you could be interested by this. This is in the pseudo users mailing list. Now, I'm a user of pseudo, but I would never consider joining the mailing list. But there were enough people, apparently, on that mailing list that thought, that's a good idea. We should do that. And that's the, that's the first line. That's the bit that I quite like. I hope you don't consider this as spam. This, essentially, is the Linus Torvalds, our version of Linus Torvalds, just for fun. This is the thing that started it. If this mail had got itself into a kill file or a spam folder, none of us would be here right now. So it's because of that bit but we're kind of lucky. So as we say, the origins were in 2001, and it started in Brussels, and it's always in Brussels, and I'm kind of happy that it is, because the very first indexing system was created in Brussels. It wasn't Google. It was the Mundanium in 1934 by Paul Otlet. He had groups of people going through every single book they could find and creating indexes of everything in those books. It was a slow manual version of Google, but it worked and it was created here. So I'm very happy that it's here. I'm also happy that it's free to attend. Not because of the money aspect. It's, this is free as in freedom, not free as in beer. By the time you've taken into account the hotels and the travel, an extra tenner for a conference is nothing. But for someone that doesn't have that, that puts a barrier to entry. And by having it free to enter, it's always been barrier. Bar 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 forget I said that bit. Can we get it out of the live stream? No, we can't. So there was a registration, but no one really used it. And it started as OSDEM rather than FOSDEM by Raphael Baudin. Baudin? Baudin? Raphael. Is, anyone, is anyone Belgian in the audience? How's this pronounced? Sorry? How's it pronounced? Raphael Baudouin. Thank you. Oh, sorry, what's your name? Raphael Baudouin. <laughs> come up, come up. Thank you, thank you. So thank you for coming along. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm so glad we can pronounce your name now. Uh, you started this in 2001. Yes. Uh, why? Well, at that time, it was the, the big boom of free software and open source, and Linux was growing in the enterprise. Before that, Linux was not used. It was, was not considered serious enough to, to be used in the enterprise. But then it started growing, and there were conferences, but those conferences were rather 
commercial. You had the Linux Expo in Paris, but I went there and I mean, I felt like not comfortable there. I wanted to, to hear technical talks, mm -hmm. uh, and meet people, meet developers, and there you, you had people in suits and talking commercial. It didn't interest me. And when coming back, I thought, well, let's try something. And it started in uh, November 2000, trying to, to get people to, to come along. It was, uh, yeah, not, not envisioned to, to grow that big at that time. So it sounds like it was intended to be fun. It was intended to, to be fun from the start because we are, we are all here to, to have fun, no? No? Yeah? Okay. So we want to enjoy the weekend. When you, I wanted that people coming to the weekend enjoy their time here. And that's why we have some serious talks about techni technical stuff and some less serious things like the free software song, the first time dance. But then, uh, yeah. Hang okay. on, wait, wait, wait on. First time dance? <laughs> no, uh, well, people know it, people know it. You know does, it, no? Does anyone want to see the full stem dance? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do the full stem dance? I see that coming, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the key thing for the full stem dance is to be relaxed, okay? No stress. I give you the microphone. And how did, did it start? Well, it started by uh, Damien Sandras, which is known from Ekiga. He was one of the first involved in the organization, and he, he, was, he was doing a lot, like uh, most of us at that time, because the, the team was very small. And he said, yeah, you know, the first weekend, it's always like running, 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 running. And that's how we started the first and downs. Now you know everything. <laughs> so I was going to ask, actually, as well, um, the first ones must have been difficult to organize if no one had ever heard of it. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, it was really started from nothing. So the concept was clear from the beginning. It was a technical conference for developers, by developers. But then you have to, to get people to the event. And to get the people to the event, you have to organize something, have talks. And to have people interested in the talks, you try to get people that are known. And that's where you, you start to get some problems, because how do you get people to an unknown conference? Well, that's why it started the weekend that was right before the Linux conference in Paris. Uh, I thought that would be easier to get known people to the conference. And it kind of was, but then you had the problem of getting those people over. Uh, you had costs, travel costs, uh, hotel costs. And it was very hard to get some sponsoring for the first event. But then the, I had the luck that it was the boom of Linux in the enterprise. There were some companies that made big IPOs at that time. And one of these companies was VA Linux. And um, they had a Belgian there uh, for the commercial side, and he decided to support for them, which was called OSDEM at the time. And that's how we got a lot of uh, VA Linux employees at the conference. And we, we had the possibility to invite a lot more speakers and paying their travel. And that's how we had some big names like uh, Rasmus Levdov, from PHP, we had uh, Rasterman, we had uh, uh, Fyodor from Nmap. Um, so that's really helped a lot to get people, speakers at the event. And once you have well-known people speaking at the event, well, you have interest growing. And in the end, when the event started, we didn't know how many people would come at the event. Of course, that's why we tried to put a registration page at the first event, 
but it was optional to make it clear you, you are always welcome. And yeah, we ended up with uh, 600 people for the first, uh, first, first event, which was not expected when I started uh, the organization, but you, you felt that the event was growing and the interest was there. So it was not a big surprise uh, to have that much people, but it was really um, a, good, a good thing. And yeah, a lot of efforts went in the event, and it was uh, a good thing to see the, the success of the first event. Excellent. One final thing. There was some talk on one of my mailing lists uh, for people to come in the oldest FOSDEM shirt they have. In my case, it's the oldest FOSDEM shirt I have that I can still fit. <laughs> I found this picture online of you back in 2001. Do you yes. still have that shirt? Well, you know, that's an old t-shirt, 20 years ago. I have a girlfriend, she complains that my t-shirts are too old. I should change. But, but... Thank you very much. Give back to your seat. Yes. That's Raphael. Incredible. Yes. <laughs> so, what was 2001 like? I'm pretty sure there were people in this room who weren't alive at that point. Are you laughing because that's you, or because you're aware of someone that it? See that? That's a long time. So, what was it like in the real world? You know, not this cosy thing that we inhabit. Well, the world population is now up to 7.4 billion, 7.8 billion actually. So we've managed to amass another 1.8 billion in the time that this conference has been running. We've had Euros, George W. Bush was the, the president, and Leah Schumacher um, had landed. Uh, that's a space probe which for the first time had landed on an asteroid. Now that's quite an impressive feat for anyone on any day of the year. But this for me is quite interesting. Not because I like space and I'm a space fan, that's kind of a given. But back then, satellites were landed on asteroids or they were sent into space and it was always proprietary. Proprietary hardware, proprietary software. We now have open source hardware in space. We have open source software running stuff. In space. We've got CubeSats. It's now possible for us to be able to build our own satellites and stick them in orbit. All from the time when this started to now. And I find that quite impressive. Oh, and um, Billie Eilish was born in December 2001. Is there anyone over 30 who knows who Billie Eilish is? I don't believe half of you. <laughs> but then again, she is writing the new James Bond theme, so maybe you should. So our pop stars are now old, are younger than this conference. And in tech, we had no Facebook in 2001. I had no idea that was an applause cue. <laughs> I thought that was information. Uh, there was no Twitter. Oh, less of a muted one for that. No Stack Overflow. Oh, uh, found the level, have we? Uh, and no Uber. Yeah. But unfortunately, if it wasn't for Uber, some of us would still be stuck on that bus. Uh, Amazon, Google, they're all really young, and the fun one, because a lot of us are, are Linuxy type people, um, Microsoft had released XP. That's now end of line. Microsoft's next operating system, Windows 7, is now out of line. We have managed to pass two versions of Windows, one of the biggest companies, of biggest products, and we beat two of them. So, 2001 in FOSDEM terms. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is not page one, by the way. This is all of it. <laughs> this is every single one of the 31 talks present in that first weekend. And there's, there's a lot of good stuff on there. If, one thing you'll notice if you can read the writing. Every session was pretty much an hour and a half or an hour. We've got talks on there. Um, um, security, databases, Samba, PHP, and somewhere there's a quantum computing talk. There. Quantum computing back in 2001. 
We were so far ahead of the curve. But then again, also 2001 was the year of Linux on the desktop. If you like that joke, you will like it when I do it again in a minute. So the early years for me were characterized a lot by these longer talks with deep dives. Uh, we had, I hope his name is pronounced Rindal, who created the RSA encryption system, AES. He came and spoke here and gave one of the most technical talks ever, I think just to try and find out if there were any technical people at FOSDEM. I think it's now safe to say there are technical people at FOSDEM, and he was quite impressed. Also, um, back then, we had um, Clam AV, which I remember. I mean, I was sat there where you are, and I was just going, wow, I understand what antivirus thing does. I understand the code, because I can read the code, it's open for me. But the bit in the middle about how the algorithms were created and how they were, was something I'd never really understood. And that talk was deep enough and long enough for me to, for me to be able to understand it. And that was incredible. Hey, and I was that where you are, so you've got to be doing this in 20 years, okay? What else? Oh, this picture, by the way, just to point out, this is, I think, 2002, 2003. Um, you'll notice the lack of food vans. You'll also notice the lack of people. This was a time you could actually take photographs of your friends and not get photobombed. Also, I think there's about three or four writers for Linux magazine in that picture. And it wasn't intentional. It wasn't a meet-up thing. It just so happens that the people who were around at the time just so happen to all write for that same magazine. Although these are meant to be my friends. I'm not taking the picture, and I'm not in the picture. So I have no idea where they were. Uh, Fosdem Info Desk, donations always had a thing. Uh, you know, you, you donate 25 euros, you got the t-shirt. Donate 50 euros, you got a t-shirt and the chance of winning a, an O'Reilly book. Or you uh, donate 35 and you get a, an O'Reilly pocket guide book. There was always these tiers that you could invest in. And you'll also notice 25 euros back then, and still 25 euros now. Don't take that as a thing to price hike, by the way. It's just an observation. Also, uh, Foster Minister, a bunch of wacko loonies at your service. I don't know if they still use that tagline, but it might still apply. <laughs> what else? Uh, there was always sponsorship. As Raphael was saying, you kind of need sponsorship to be able to get people in. And it is difficult. Uh, VA Linux was sponsored in the first year, and uh, O'Reilly managed to pick up the baton in the second year for a lot of things. But there was never this whole, there is a sponsor, and they will be doing a 20-minute presentation every day on their thing. Never happened. O'Reilly had a stand out there. That was it. That, that was their sort of promotion thing, if you like. So we've always done pretty well for the not spamming things. And over these early years, the dev rooms grew and grew. Never quickly, just steadily. A few extra dev rooms each time, doubling up the dev room. So one day this room would be part of computing dev room. Another day, that would be the IoT dev room. And we'll come back to dev rooms later on uh, to show you some of the success stories that FOSDEM has had in those dev rooms. Uh, I mailed Miguel a little while ago. Uh, you probably recognize him from either Mo Mono or Gnome or something that he's done, but... He reminded me of the, this is Coca-Cola. Was anyone there when he was heckled with the line, this is Coca-Cola? Not many. Um, this started out, he was demoing Mono and was showcasing the different uses. And one of them was with Unity, which is a proprietary 3D graphics engine. And he was demonstrating that it would work. Not that he was necessarily promoting Unity. So from the back of the room, someone shouted, this is Coca-Cola. This is Coca-Cola. Which didn't make any sense. Thought it was a translation problem. What it actually transpired is that the person didn't like the idea of proprietary software being used with free software. And that sort of thing was not uncommon. Not the heckling of this is Coca-Cola. But the idea of proprietary things were always bad and it was always evil. Nowadays, half of you may well have an iPhone. I'm using a Mac. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think I've got 50-50 of the move on that one. Uh, but I can guarantee, if I'd have done that in 2001 with a Mac, it would have been more 99 to 1 against me. We have at least grown up in that sense. Because I, I don't like my Mac, but I use it, to be fair. Um, what else? Josette. Um, she was manning the O'Reilly stall um, for the longest time. 
And if you're watching Gisette, hello! It's a, it's, this is not going to end good. Uh, I'll say, can we have a um, power person for my. So Josette uh, manned the O'Reilly stand for the longest time. It was actually her that managed to get us the second round of funding for the uh, second Osdem, which would be the first real Osdem rather than Osdem. The mail went into her spam folder, essentially. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll look at it later, I'll look at it later, I'll get round to it. And it wasn't, I think, until, I think it, Raphael was the one that mailed back a couple of weeks before and says, are you going to give us the money or not? And she went, oh, sorry, yeah, I got, I'll get on to it. And because of that, we were able to get a second round and, as a consequence, get the third and the fourth. And O'Reilly have managed to have a stand here most years. And we know why they're not here this year, unfortunately. So next up. No, it's going to boot. OK, so we switch to that one, then? Things work better. So here we have a technical reason why I hate my Mac. And I have no idea why I did that. This is not a microphone. That's my mic. I just did that like a microphone. <laughs> What's in this stuff? I thought, I'll get myself a nice little beer. I've always done this, by the way. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed. When I first started doing Fosden, I didn't see anyone drinking beer while they were presenting. I thought it was like a health and safety thing, or the university didn't allow it, something like that. But I got to do my first talk, and I thought, I'm in Belgium. I should try and fit in. Belgians eat chocolate and they drink beer. I should drink beer when I do my talk. So I got a beer and I put it on the top and no one told me to take it away. So I thought, oh, maybe beer is allowed. So then I opened the beer and it went No one's ears pricked up and said, oh, he's doing beer, that's not allowed. So I just started the talk and I went, right, here we go. And I've done it every, ever since. Which is a nice sort of tradition to have until you start getting multiple talks in the same day <laughs> and you realise this is really not healthy. I mean, this is my third today. The third bit and the third talk. So already maybe that's why I'm using it as a microphone. Who knows? <laughs> but it is one of those things that you just... Every year you learn something new about either the place or the culture. And it happens quite a lot. Um, one year, we decided, OK, we've done the Fosdem thing, but we've never done the Brussels thing. Every year we would come along, we'd see the inside of the theatres here, and we'd see the inside of the bars out there, but we'd never see anything else in Brussels, at least not in the daylight. So we thought, next year, we'll take a day off work, and we'll stay Sunday night, and see Brussels on the Monday. And that's what we did. Booked next to the hotel, booked the train, we go along fantastic. We had a list of museums to see. And this is back before Google and stuff, so we were just relying on uh, guidebooks, essentially. And we made a list of all the museums we wanted to see, and we got up nice and early at 10 o'clock to go and see the museums. Turns out, all the museums and all of the galleries in Brussels uh, are, you know, the Museum of Comics, open brackets, Femme Lundi. Now, I don't know what a Femme Lundi museum is, but all of the museums in Brussels were also run by Femme Lundi. It took me a while to learn enough French to realise that Fermilla Lundi means closed on Monday, and we had just wasted a day. <laughs> Luckily, we now have translation apps, which allow me to be the stupid Englishman that only speaks one language, to get around Brussels. And this is one of those many things that come out, especially the social elements of Brussels and of Fosdem. So we're we ready to go again. OK. So the, the first few years, from about 2000 to 2000, 2001 to 2007, followed pretty much the same idea. You have a number of main tracks in here, you have a number of dev rooms, and every year it goes up by one or two more dev rooms. Uh, by 2007, the formats had kind of stabilised. Uh, lightning talks had been introduced, which back then were quite a novelty. 15 minutes each talk. Now, with a lot of talks coming down to 25, there's a lot more parallels between new and old. As you see, things haven't really changed. And that was the inspiration for the title, the cliche of constant change. The whole thing of the more things change, the more they stay the same. So a lot of the main talks now are becoming more like the lightning talks were back then. And those stats will definitely be erroneous, I can tell you that. So, so yes, we talked about Josette. 
And here are the basic stats. As I just say, they, they go up gradually, always up and to the right. All the stats you'll see go up and to the right. That's important. So what, what sort of milestones have we got over those early few, first few years? So 2002, we hosted the Free Software Awards on this stage. So naturally, the award for 2001 was given in February 2002 and so on. So all the famous names came along to stand on the stage and tell us what they'd done and why that was important. Key signing parties started in 2005. I personally call them key signing events. People standing outside in the cold in February in Brussels doesn't sound like a party to me, but if that's your bag, you go for it. <laughs> key signing events. Uh, the lightning talks, as I've said, they did start in 2005, but back then not every talk was updated on the site. There was a CMS from 2002 onwards, but not everyone was forced to put their information into it at the start. So a lot of those earlier talks will have been lost. 2012, however, we have Pentabath. For those that have not spoken here, this is the system you have to put your details in about what you wish to speak about and what the topic's going to be and what room you think it applies. Uh, it's a big chunk of XML, but it does kind of work, even though it has occasionally put the same speaker in two different rooms at the same time. <laughs> Happens. Uh, 2014, Christoph created an app. Uh, it was quite a, if I can recall my slides, I think there's about, yes, 4,000 active installations. Um, but that doesn't include anything on F-Droid, because that stuff apparently is not tracked. So there's probably a lot more people who have installed that than are actually on the screen now. According to the people I spoke to earlier, the first video boxes, these nice wooden ones, they were first created and put together in 2015 and then first put into boxes 2016. So that's quite a relatively new thing. But even before that, people were setting up cameras on tables and just filming it. There used to be an old website called, I think, opensource.tv, where people would upload these sort of videos. And that's noticeable because the conference is older than YouTube. It's also older than Flickr as well. And we'll come to a good reason for that as well later. And 2016, very importantly, we started having glossy brochures. Now, for those that weren't there, let me show you what the brochures used to look like when I was a wee kid and all this were fields. This. It's probably so small you probably can't see it at the back. It's a couple of sheets of paper stapled together, and that's the entire conference program, everything. Fast forward a couple of years, this is 2002, this is 2008. You can see already that by 2008, Fosden were having to buy a more expensive brand of staple. For some reason, 2015 had a different color, but then by 2016, we have these. These are the ones that you probably all now recognize. Big glossies and enough information to warrant a separate one for each day. Quite an impressive feat, particularly as I've still got them. So coming back to the cliche of constant change. Every year, the dev rooms change. There's a few more. Sometimes old ones fall out of favor, but they're always there. Stalls is an introduction. There's always lots and lots of stalls. And for this, I will need to find some notes because that is going to be quite interesting. Honest, it will be. So, yeah. There's, there were lots and lots of things going on. Actually, I'm going to come back to that. I think that there's a reason for that. So, going back quickly to the dev rooms. The dev rooms have often changed their names. So sometimes it will be the MySQL dev room. Sometimes it will be the MySQL MariaDB and Friends dev room. Sometimes it will be the MySQL and Friends dev room. I've yet, I don't know what MariaDB to warrant not being considered a friend in the other one, but I've yet to see a Postgres and MySQL and Friends dev room. <laughs> Can anyone tell me why? Uh, so. There was, a, there was a case in, the, in, in, in K building, which is where most of the stands are now. And there was a time OpenSUSE got beer. I think they've done it again this year. And they've got a number of OpenSUSE beers at the stand. Um, the Mozilla people, uh, so I'm told, went over to their stand, bought all of their beer, and took it back to the Mozilla stand. The Mozilla people then put a sticky label on all of the beers and sold it on their stand. Therefore, 
that it's the first time anyone has taken a beer and then forked it. <laughs> There's also stories of people who have driven here back in 2001, 2002, which is impressive from the point of view of there was no GPS for humans back then. It was all military grade. So the people driving around with paper maps trying to work out how to get here. That must have been fun. We've got a number of dev room wins, which are, uh, some of which I'll come back to later. But one of the ones to actually point out is Freedom Box. Now, this is something that Evan Mogul talked about in 2011 on this stage and in 2013. And he was good enough to send me a little update video uh, of where they've got to. So let's see if that will play. Is that spinner a good thing or a bad thing? Thank you to Steve Can for I? inviting me to nope. comment on our uh, earlier experiences together at Foston, which from 2011 were about the Freedom Box project. Freedom Box is very dear to my heart, as it was then when we were together in 2011-2013. Because it is now time for us in the free software movement face the reality we have been afraid of all our lives. We came to work on free software because we believed that technological freedom was absolutely necessary to the survival of civil liberty all around the world. We thought that computers that didn't work for their users, that their users couldn't understand, couldn't change, couldn't fix, and couldn't share, would be computers that would eliminate the possibility of freedom. And unfortunately, we were right. Now, after a generation, after all these years together at FOSDEM, after all these decades of work, we are in the place in which if we can't deliver freedom to people using free software, we cannot be sure that liberty will survive. That was why I started the Freedom Box Project, to see if we could use the smallest, cheapest computers available in the world to deliver real freedom-respecting services to everybody. Now, after all these years, we are ready. This, a Freedom Box manufactured under license by Olimex in Bulgaria, is the first commercial product using our wonderful free software to deliver freedom. We can also run in everything from an orange Pi to a Raspberry Pi to an Arduino board to a, an, a virtual instance in the AWS cloud. All of this happened because people who were together with us in Brussels saw the importance of this vision because free software programmers from around the world now want to deliver freedom to users everywhere, to their families, their friends, and their communities. This is what FOSDEM is about. This is what Freedom Box is about. This is the life we have lived together and for which I am so very grateful. Thank you to FOSDEM. Thank you to Steve. Thank you to those who believe in freedom. Thanks to Evan. So, of course, it wouldn't be FOSDEM if it wasn't in Brussels, I guess. And that's kind of helped, because in the same way that FOSDEM was able to get its first speakers by, shall we say, borrowing some from the Paris Linux conference, other conferences have started up around FOSDEM and around the time. Uh, PG Day, for example, has been going quite a few years now to coincide with FOSDEM. Uh, um, there was a Git thing last year that I was at. Um, and also, Java has their committers workshop around this sort of time as well, I believe. Which has really helped, because it's kind of worked in the same way that servers have worked. We start with a monolith, which is FOSDEM. And then we create microservices. Those are the dev rooms. And then it's function as a service, which are the lightning talks, the birth of a feather talks. And then those ex reaching out to other conferences they create outside of the FOSDEM tracks, now known as the FOSDEM fringe. But of course, I was saying it's not all work. And we do try and pretend to have some fun. There is this misconception that geeks don't socialize. That is not true. Anyone that's been in the delirium on Friday night knows that's not true. The only thing that might be considered true 
is that we don't want to socialize with people like that. People that think, oh, you're a bit geeky, we don't like you. We socialize. And these are the only clean pictures I'm allowed to use. So this is what we had back in 2001, 2002. I'm showing this for one particular reason. There's no camera on that camera phone. Yes, they did exist. Phones without a camera meant we could get away with a lot of stuff that we probably couldn't now. The other problem with this, it means people had to take their rather expensive SLR cameras into pubs if we wanted to get any pictures. Luckily, some people were brave enough to take their nice, ca uh, phones in, nice cameras into pubs, and this is one of them. Uh, this is in the Roy de Spagna on Grand Plus. This is where we had the first number of uh, Friday Night Beer events. As you can see, there's actually space in there. <laughs> Probably room for a few more people around that table. And also, we have seats. And also, in this particular place, because there weren't that many of us, the bartenders would come around, they'd take our drinks order, and at the end of the night, they'd say, what did you drink? Now, I don't know if these bartenders have ever experienced people having alcohol before. <laughs> but asking someone, what have you drunk? It's like, well, just two pints of shandy, me, mate. It's not going to cut it, particularly when some of my friends don't drink at all. So when you get to the end of the night and they just say, I had two Coca-Colas, they go, no, you didn't. <laughs> Luckily, I'm proud to say that after many years of doing this, I now understand how strong Belgian beer is and how many I can have before I need to leave Delirium in order to get in for the Saturday keynote. There's also parties and dinners going on most, most of the evenings, uh, Saturday as usual, uh, particularly for us a lot. Again, that's me with more hair. Uh, and this is where you know, a lot of the stories and a lot of the, the real things come out, the information that you don't hear on the tracks. Um, and, be, and I think I'm allowed to tell this story. Um, at a table once, and there's about seven or eight of us all there, and one person is complaining about how hard it is to compile KDE and how hard it is to package KDE, not realizing that the person who compiled and packaged KDE was sat next to them. <laughs> Mansplaining was not invented recently. We've been doing it for years. It's also in the same restaurant, actually. Um, we, we were sat around, and we thought, let's get a picture. And we asked the waitress, could you take a picture? And give her the camera. And she says, OK, everybody, say cheese. So what do you think every single geek at that table did in unison, thinking it would be a funny joke? They said fromage. <laughs> the only French they obviously know. And even more dinners. Again, it's one of those things that you never know who you're going to end up getting sat next to and talking to at these sort of events. I've, I've, um, Ran Moula, I've probably got that very wrong, uh, created by... Sat next to me one night at dinner, Phil Hazel from Exim fame. Sat next opposite me another night at dinner. This is not me bragging, by the way. This is normal. This happened pretty much every night to somebody during the course of FOSDEM. And the city tours are a comparatively recent thing. I could never quite find out when they started. But now the partners of us lot have the option of going out to get a free city tour so they can see Brussels. Oh, you know, it's a nice thing to do. I don't know if that means more people are going to do it next year, because I've told you all it exists. Uh, but it's, it's a thing that's been laid on. And it was always for partners, never for wives and girlfriends. So occasionally, we get things right. Except for this thing, beer mat buckaroo. There are probably people in this room that have played it. Uh, I, I know at least where two of them are. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But beer mat buckaroo. It's a game to be played late at night in the bars of Brussels. First them's quite a long concert, uh, conference, quite grueling. You're up quite early, you're out quite late. So even when you sat in a rock club in the middle of Brussels, you've been up for 12 hours, you're a bit tired, you may fall asleep. It is then the responsibility of other people with you to place beer mats on your head one at a time. One beer mat per person. Whoever puts the beer mat on the head when that person wakes up, loses and buys the next round. <laughs> there are no real winners in this, except for that poor sap who's... Oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> so what is it like today? Well, we've looked at a lot of the history. So what sort of numbers have we got here? 
And I wrote a short script that would go through the, the history of the conference. But before I take you through that, I'm just going to do a one-minute thing walking over here. Because 20 years is quite literally a long time. It is a generation. And in the same way that lots of people have come into our lives over the last 20 years, we've also lost a lot as well. And these are not the only people. We've all lost someone at some point in that time. And it's unfortunately inevitable. But there we have it. So, moving on, let's get down to some good old serious mucking about. And all these stats will have caveats attached to them. As I say, I have gone through all the old websites and did a copy and paste of them. So I might have missed things. Uh, there may be names which I've got incorrect. Uh, but as I say, it's on GitHub. So if I made a typo, I do accept pull requests. We might eventually get a full record of everything that happened at FOSDEM. So in just this year, we've had 817 talks by 781 different speakers. Every year, up and to the right, up and to the right, always increasing, always steadily. Now, obviously, this number is kind of contentious. You know, we say 817 talks. Should we include the beginning talks and the end talks? Should we include LPI, exams, and uh, that sort of thing? So, you know, you could vary this by a few, but this gives you a rough idea of the scale of which we're speaking. There are 55 dev rooms. As you can see, the number of dev rooms increases, as does the number of talks. In fact, if you were to go and listen to every single talk that's happened over just this weekend. If my memory serves, it will take you nine and a half weeks every day, eight hours a day, including Saturdays and Sundays, to get through everything from just this. Now, you multiply that up over the last 20 years. If you wanted to catch up with FOSDEM, <laughs> you know, the FOSDEM binge watch channel would last you until August. These are the speakers speaking this weekend. Well, no, that's technically that's a picture of the speakers who are speaking this weekend. And if you squint hard enough, you can just about make out the FOSDEM logo in amongst all of that. As far as I know, everyone is included. My apologies if I managed to miss someone, you know, because there was a, a late change or something like that. So if we accumulate all of these numbers, what sort of totals do you think we're going to get? Well, let's start with the number of talks. In total, since started, 7,281. That is pretty much an inconceivable number. 4,001 unique speakers. Unique. That's more people than attended the first four FOSDEMs put together. and 149 different dev rooms. Now, I think I've got rid of all the, you know, the typos in there, and, you know, and embedded was embedded, and embedded and automotive, and, and so forth. The same dev room had several titles during its lifetime. The graphics dev room used to be the XORG dev room, I believe. But still, 149 different subjects in open source, which is not surprising. It's a big industry. And you realize this when you walk out. If you ever give a talk, and you really should, if you give a talk and you walk out, the strangest thing happens. You're in the room. You're looking at 100, 200 people. In this case, 2,000 people. Right now, I feel like the most important person in open source that there is. That's not the laugh. I'll, I'll tell you when I'm doing the funnies, OK? When I, but when I walk out that door, I am nobody. Everyone else is more famous than I am. Everyone else has done more, been on better projects, more involved projects. Because no matter how big your project is, there's always another one that's bigger or more impressive. And this is the dev room totals. Mozilla, well done. You win. Uh, <laughs> hard luck embedded, you kind of forgot that one, so you'd, you'd have been caught up well. But as you can see, the dev rooms are quite a flowing thing. Sometimes we have a lot of dev rooms at the start, and like GNOME, and then afterwards, like, dev rooms not needed anymore. And the space is taken up by other things, like software-defined radio. I didn't even know that was a thing until I saw it at FOSDEM. 
And there's a lot of good stories from these things. I think probably the biggest story is Java. Now, originally, there was a project called GNU Class Path. Anyone remember GNU Class Path? Yes. Uh, and there were, and there was, I think there was a free Java and an open Java and about seven or eight different Java type projects trying to do the open version. Well, it turned out that someone managed to persuade Sun to open source their Java. And the people that did it, did it at FOSDEM. So the reason we have open Java and the reason is FOSDEM, which unfortunately means Larry didn't get to buy a yacht that year. But I'm happy to trade Larry's yacht for Open Java. Yes, well done, Java. I'm sure we've got some of the Java people in that are responsible for that as well. So you know, we should buy them a beer later. So the total in words. So I went through every talk title for the last 20 years. I removed the ands and the ofs and the nots and all those sort of tiny words. And I built this. Now, you've got all the obvious words in there, you know, like open and source and software and community. But there are also two words in there that kind of st stuck out to me. Um, and that was fun and the word profit. So I was very curious on how I could make a profit with this open source. But it turns out there were about eight or nine talks, all labeled, go and do this for fun and profit. Go and do that for fun and profit. Every single time there's a for fun and profit talk, you are required to keep this tradition going. So in the conclusions, it started small, very small, incredibly hopelessly small, and built up gradually, small blocks. That way, there could never be too many surprises. Same as in code. Make one change at a time, then you know where the breakage is. Small things added continually. Always something new, always something else happening. That ethos thing has not changed. Free is still good, free is still here. Dev rooms do seem to be the biggest draw now. But as I say, there are fringe events which keep cropping up every single year. I mean, nowadays we've got, what's, as I say, 700 talks here. Going on at any one time this year, there were more talks than there were in the entirety of the first FOSDEM. Basically, you could take the first FOSDEM and run it in the morning session on Saturday, and we could all be in the pub by lunchtime. <laughs> so what happens now? How do I predict the future? What is FOSDEM going to be doing over the next 20 years? Well, I can tell you exactly what FOSDEM is going to be doing. Oh, no, sorry, I've run out of time. So I can't tell you what FOSDEM is going to be doing over the next 20 years. But it's all down to whatever you say, whatever we say. It's our conference. It's open. It's for us. So I, I will uh, finish my slide by updating my scorecard. Ding! There we go. And normally, I would finish on a slide of any questions. But as I said at the beginning, I'm not an organizer. I'm not a volunteer. I just turn up. So instead of any questions, I'm going to phrase it, any answers. Because you can contact me via the website on the Twitters. I want to hear your stories. I want to see what, what successes have you had because of FOSDEM. What has FOSDEM helped for you? Because in 20 years' time, there's going to be someone else sat up there where I was sat 20 years ago. And they're going to be up here saying, how has free software helped and saved the world? And it will be because of someone in this audience and some of the projects that are based here. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention. It's been the biggest, biggest audience I've ever seen. Thank you. Now, if there's anyone here, if there's anyone here wearing a, a, a FOSDEM t-shirt, what I'm trying to do is organize a photograph of every year of FOSDEM out those doors and out the front in about 20 minutes. So if you've got like a 2001 shirt, yep, we want you. There's not many of them around. 2002, I'm wearing one of these underneath. Uh, I've also got a few other shirts around. So if you do have one of those old shirts and want to be in the picture, make your way outside in about 20 minutes, and you'll be able to be in that picture.